Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Major General James Miles, Commander of the United States Army Aviation and Missile Life Cycle Management Command, it's my privilege to welcome you to Team Redstone's Day of Remembrance Commemoration Program. My name is Rabbi Jeffrey Ballin of the local temple here, uh, Temple B'nai Shalom, and proudly a retired United States Army Reserve uh, Army Chaplain. I will be serving as your Master of Ceremonies for today's program. I invite you now to stand for the National Anthem, which will be performed by Ms. Lola Spearman, and remain standing for the invocation, which will be given by Chaplain Kopech. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave Oh, the land of the free and the home of the Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created each of us in your own image and equal in your eyes. Throughout human history, we often ignore that truth. That led to death and destruction. As we gather today, help us to learn from history, overcome obstacles, and recognize equality of all. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to take this opportunity now to introduce our distinguished guests who are attending today's program. And we invite you at the end of the introductions to uh, show your appreciation. We welcome Major General uh, James Miles, Commanding General, U.S. Army Aviation and Missile Life Cycle Management Command. So too do we welcome Mr. Ed Lessing, the primary keynote speaker of the Hidden Child Foundation and Command Sergeant Ricky Yates, Commander Sergeant Major of the U.S. Army Aviation and Missile Life Cycle Management Command. We are also pleased to welcome all active and retired officers and members of the Senior Executive Service, commanders, deputies, senior enlisted spouses, and other distinguished guests in attendance today. A warm welcome is extended to each and every one of you. At this time, it's my privilege to invite uh, General Miles to deliver the welcome remarks. Sir. Thanks, Rabbi. First of all, uh, Mr. Leslie, thank you for being here. We're really blessed to have you here, and it's, it's really an honor to have you here, especially when I've, I've had a chance to read your bio and I see what you've done. Um, you are, you are my pri a primary exhibit of what we try to talk about uh, for these, uh, for this day of remembrance and every one of these observance days that we have throughout the year. And it's about trying to remember our past so we don't repeat it. And uh, our, this human nature is something that is, uh, we all believe that, that our human nature is good. I really wake up every morning of the day and I say, you know what, everybody's coming to work to try to do wonderful, great things for our country and they're not waking up to go mess things up. Um, and that's the way my, I believe, and that's the way most Americans believe. But in some parts of this world here, they don't have enough confidence in each other 
um, because of a variety of things that occur in human nature. And sometimes the humans need to be, we all need to be reminded of where we came from and the challenges that have occurred in our past. And if we don't remember those things and embrace them, we will have issues. And we must always remember that. And uh, sir, I, I'm really looking forward to your remarks today here so that you can remind us again about some of the challenges that you've had that we all need to remember. It was, I was having a, having a conversation with, uh, with Mr. Mr. Lessing and, and, and the rabbi here, uh, Malone, for prior to coming here uh, in the other room. And, and the question I had was, how could we possibly find ourselves in a position that in one country, um, a, large cor a large portion of the population turned on another portion of the population and, they, and genocide occurred? It still occurs in, Af in Africa. But you think about it in Germany, and you say, how could uh, civilized people do what they did? And we have to remember that, because it really did happen. And it really can happen again if we don't remember and understand what occurred and remember the challenge that they had. And we're blessed to have Mr. Lessing here today who lived that legend. Uh, and it's not a good legend. And so, sir, we're very honored to have you here, and we look forward to your remarks here. And uh, you're here to help us remember from the theme that I just talked about here, and, and uh, I'm just thrilled that you're here. Am I introducing him? No, sir. Okay. Well, <laughs> top that, damn it. If you <laughs> would. <laughs> but if you would like to, we could arrange it. <laughs> no, we're, we're good. We're good. But uh, for, for everybody, this is what this is all about, and you are lucky to have uh, someone like this that's, uh, that's been here, that's walked on the battlefields. From, from what I talk about, um, I, I love soldiers who have actually gone out and conducted combat operations because we have to learn and respect them because they were out on the field of battle. Sir, you've been on this field of battle, and that's why I respect you. I'm looking forward to your remarks here, and I appreciate everybody being here today. Cool. Thank you, sir. By your leave, sir, I'd like to invite uh, Colonel Newman uh, to introduce our speaker. All right, Chief. All right, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Following the lead of my boss, I'll, uh, I'll remain down here as well. I think I can be heard from here. Uh, sir, you did a good job introducing Mr. Lessing, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll call a couple of other facts to everybody's attention. Uh, you know, Mr. Lessing is a person who has lived the history, which we may have read about, we may know something about. We are very privileged to have you here, sir. Thank you from the entire Redstone community. As a young boy, he was living in Holland in 1940 when the Nazis invaded Holland and Western Europe. And he had a ringside seat literally to the events of the invasion. And shortly after the invasion was completed and the Nazis occupied Holland, his family had to disperse and go into hiding because the persecution began shortly after the Germans arrived. As a young boy, and it's the circumstances just hard to imagine, but he participated in an armed resistance group against the Nazi occupation and had to live in the woods and avoid the German raiding party sent out to find the guerrilla uh, fighters, which he was a part of, and he narrowly escaped death in that situation. While his family was dispersed, his mother was captured by the Nazis and sent to a concentration camp. She did not survive. His father, his brothers, and he eventually managed to hide in a Dutch farmhouse and survive the war. After the war, he emigrated to the United States. He married his wife, Carla. Shortly after that, they went to Israel. And he spent five years there in a kibbutz in Israel. A kibbutz is a communal farm, and usually they were located close to the borders of Israel, not only for farming, but for defense. So in addition to surviving the Holocaust, he helped participate in the building of a new nation in the Middle East. A tremendous achievement. And if that's the only thing he did in his life, he could be extremely proud of that accomplishment. After five years in Israel, he moved back to the United States. He then became active in efforts to publicize the Holocaust and speak and write about it. He is a member of the Hidden Child Foundation, the Anti-Deformation League. He is a primary speaker. He addresses Holocaust events in many locations, to include many in the U.S. Army. He's been to Korea, he's been to Fort Drum, he's been to Rock Island, and now he's here at Redstone Arsenal, Alabama, to tell us about his experiences and remind us why we should never forget. Again, Mr. Lesson, thank you for being here today. We're looking forward to hearing your remarks. So that you're on.
I appear and the lights go on. It's wonderful. <laughs> and I never mind being introduced by three people, a general and a rabbi, and uh, it, it's an honor. Uh, before I uh, say anything else, I would like to say, if, in, in case you're wondering about these boards, uh, they usually stand behind me on the stage, but in this case, uh, it didn't work out too well, so um, they uh, illustrate some of the uh, things that I'm going to tell you about the past. Uh, however, I, I thought, uh, as a Holocaust survivor and a so-called hidden child, I am deeply honored, first of all, to have been invited uh, to address you, who are engaged in the defense of America and, indeed, of democracy around the world. And I'm very, very much aware of that. When I return home after this, my wife and I will celebrate a late Passover and read in the Haggadah, that is the printed guide to our ancient Jewish ceremony, and I will again encounter these fateful words that are written. For in every generation, they rise up against us to destroy us. But the Holy One, blessed be He, rescues us from their hands. And every year, I realize again how these words in the story reflect the story of my childhood, my childhood experiences, and not only that, even those, even that of my name. Passover is all about remembering the liberation from an Egyptian uh, ruler's tyranny. And I survived another ruler's murderous tyranny and possibly even with the help of my name that was so fortuitously given by my parents when I was born. They called me, they named me after my grandfather, whose name is Eliazar. Eliazar uh, is a Hebrew uh, name and it's made up out of two Hebrew words. Eli in Hebrew means my God. Azar means help. Uh, so my name really means my God helped me. And I think if it wasn't for my God, I wouldn't be standing here today because, as you all know now, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I survived uh, because my God helped me. Concerning this year's theme for the Days of Remembrance, I was not directly affected by Kristallnacht, yet I felt that I should say here a few words on that beginning of Germany's descent into genocide. It is unlikely that many of you have ever heard the name of Herschel Grinspan. Um, a Jewish boy, young man living with his uncle in Paris in October of 1938. But then neither had many Germans. Yet for Hitler's Reichspropaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, Herschel Grinspan served as the excuse to unleash the pogrom against the Jews in Germany. When in 1938 the Nazis decided to evict all Polish Jews who had been living in Germany, they drove a group of 484 Jewish men, women and children over the Polish border. The Polish government, regarding this as an act of aggression against <laughs> Poland, refused entry to the Jews. And among these hapless Jewish people were a certain Sendel Grinspan, a tailor and his family the parents of Herschel who was living in Paris. They, like the others, found themselves between borders in a no man's land without shelter, without food. In desperation, some of the Jews tried to sneak back into Germany and were shot by border guards. Or the others committed suicide. When Herschel Grinspan learned of the terrible conditions his parents had to suffer, 
He tried in vain to get help for them at the German embassy in Paris. Herschel, finding no help there, in desperation and rage, then shot a German diplomat at the embassy in Paris. His name was Ernst von Rath. Von Rath died of his injuries on October 9, 1938. His death, portrayed by Goebbels as a major Jewish attack on Germany, served as a signal to begin the terrors of Kristallnacht. 7,500 Jewish businesses were wrecked and the shattered glass of shops, synagogues and Jewish apartments littering Germany's streets created that name of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Nearly all Jewish cemeteries in Germany and in Austria were desecrated. At least 267 synagogues were burned down and destroyed. 30,000 Jews were arrested and sent to concentration camps of Buchenwald, Dachau and Sachsenhausen. The Jewish communities were forced to bankrupt themselves and pay for the organized destruction they had suffered. Jewish insurance monies were confiscated by the Nazis and their Reich and distributed to needy German party members. Many see Kristallnacht as the murderous event that began the descent into genocide and the road to Auschwitz. <coughs> Unaware of the anti-Semitic storm that was raging nearby over the border, a 12-year-old boy could not have known that only two years later it would overtake him and leave his family in Holland in dire straits. That 12-year-old boy was me. I lived in Holland. I lived in a little town called Delft. Very pretty town, and if you ever go to Holland, please go visit Delft. It's a little bit like a small Amsterdam, and has uh, little canals meandering through it. And uh, I lived there with my father, music hall musician, my mother, a very determined lady, uh, and uh, my two little brothers, eight and 10 years younger than I. Uh, life was pretty good. I went on my bike to school. Um, I had many friends. I liked to swim. Um, all in all, I, I had very few complaints. I certainly didn't have any complaint about my 14th birthday, which was on the 8th of May. Coming up soon. Uh, 8th of May, 1940. Uh, I received a, uh, a used kayak. My parents didn't have much money. So they bought me a used kayak so I could pedal around in Delft's uh, uh, little meandering uh, waters and under those little white bridges. And uh, th there was really no reason for me to think that anything would, would change in my life very much. When two days later, on the 10th of May, I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning and seemed there was a machine gun firing right next to my bed. And when I looked out the window downstairs in the street, there was a machine gun nest with Dutch soldiers firing on, on planes that were roaring over our house. And when I looked up in the sky, the whole blue sky, that morning, morning, May morning blue sky was filled with white parachutes, very peacefully drifting down around my little town of Delft. And we thought it was an exercise by the Dutch army, but of course we found out soon that no, Germany, our neighbor to the east, had overrun the border and invaded Holland. They bombarded the city of Rotterdam to rubble, and uh, the Dutch army had to give up. Five days later, German soldiers were marching by my front door, singing very loudly that they next were going to go to England, and then probably to the United States, I guess. Uh, Hitler's friends, a certain Dr. Seiss Inquart and an SS commander Rauter, then took over the Dutch government, and we Dutch Jews uh, began to wonder, of course, what would happen to us Jews now that the Germans were in Holland. And my parents, and, my, and, and I remember my parents and my friends discussing this, and of course, the Dutch Jews being very naive, living in a country that hadn't seen any war since Napoleon's day. <coughs> Holland was... Uh, 
neutral during the First World War. Uh, the Dutch Jews said, well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't happen here, what happened in Germany. That Kristallnacht thing, for instance. That wouldn't happen here. We are a democratic country. We have houses of parliament that decide, uh, you know. Well, we were sadly mistaken. Within a very short time, the first decrees appeared in our Jewish newspaper, the Jewish newspaper that, of course, was run, was taken over by the Germans. And in there, it appeared that uh, uh, we couldn't go into buses anymore. We couldn't go into taxis. We couldn't go in a theater. We couldn't go to the beach. We couldn't go to a park where the park benches had signs on them forbidden for Jews to sit here. And so our lives were narrowed down. We were told to bring our bicycles, our radios, my parents had to bring their gold rings, the silverware, artwork from the walls, and of course businesses were confiscated. Holland's Jews were robbed blind in very short time. A decree was issued by the Reichskommissar of the Occupied Dutch Territories, which said that Jewish children could no longer attend public schools in Holland, but will have to be educated uh, in, uh, in Jewish schools only. And of course, that left me out because uh, um, I lived in a small town. There were no Jewish schools. I had to find something else to do. I became a messenger for a, a pharmacy. And uh, pretty soon later on, a uh, new decree told, uh, told us that we now had to wear a big yellow star on our jackets uh, when we went out in the street. And my mother sewed onto my jacket and my overcoats a big star that said in fake Hebrew letters, it said Jew, so that every time that I walked out in the street, everyone could see that I was a Jew. It didn't bother me actually too much. There were some people who came and shook my hand and said, hey, you be proud being a Jew. The Dutch weren't used to this anti-Semitic stuff. Yet the situation was becoming very dangerous and I don't guess I didn't realize it until one day my cousin Hans showed up. I have a cousin, his name was Hans and he lived nearby in the city of The Hague. And Hans showed up, he'd come by streetcar and said, hey, Ed, want to have some fun? I said, yeah, sure, why not? This is a terrible time. <laughs> and uh, Hans said, um, hey, you know what? We have the same overcoats, right? I said, yeah. And he said, you know, we have the same kind of, we have the same shawls and uh, you know, mufflers? I said, yeah. Uh, what about it? He said, you know, you have the same kind of shoes and same hairdo. Uh, we look alike. I said, yeah, we're cousins. We look alike, sure. I said, what do you have in mind? He said, you know what? What? Hans was a little child, he's come to think of it. Well, anyway, we were 15 years old and Hans said, uh, what if we go out in the street, we'll dress up in, our, in, in, in the same clothes, you know, and then we'll go out in the street and we'll walk next to each other and we'll pretend we're identical twins. Well, I don't see you smiling a lot, uh, thinking that was very, a lot of fun. But Hans thought so and I, I thought, okay, you know, and we walked out, walking and watching if people were saying, hey, look, identical twins. There was just one slight difference between Hans and me. I had that big yellow star on my coat and Hans didn't because his father wasn't Jewish. But it was fun anyway to walk around and to see if people, and then suddenly, halt! A German SS officer stepped in front of us. I noticed he had a little ribbon around his uniform that said, Battalion SS. Hermann Goering, and he started screaming at my cousin, what are you doing with that filthy Jew walking here? And Hans tried to explain that we were cousins, and he wouldn't listen. He said, if I see you ever walking with that piece of filth, I'll send you both to a camp, and you'll never be seen again. And then without warning, in his black gloved fist, he hit me in the face as hard as he could. And I fell on Delft's cobblestone street, bleeding from my nose. And I stayed there until he walked away. And when I got up, I suddenly realized what hate could do. Here was a man who didn't know me, who would gladly have killed me right there in the street. 
And I think that day ended my childhood, really. And I also think that after that day, after that event, I never was as careful and as trusting in this world as one should be. And of course, Hans and I never played those games again. Yet, we still try to carry on with all, all the things that the Germans forbade us to do until this, and I'll read this verbatim that appeared in our Jewish newspaper that was really run by the SS. It's from July 1942, and it says as follows. The Reichskommissar of the occupied Dutch territories announces, one, all Jews who have not immediately answered the call to work relief in Germany will be taken prisoner and transported to concentration camp Mauthausen. Two, all Jews not wearing a Jew star will be sent to concentration camp Mauthausen. Three, all Jews who without permission of the authorities change places of residence or move from their home even temporarily will be transported to concentration camp Mauthausen. So that was it then. The Germans told us to leave the country where we were born, where we had grown up, where my forefathers had lived for hundreds of years peacefully. And they told us to go on trains and to go to work relief or get killed in Mauthausen because even though we didn't know much about what the Germans had in mind in those days, it was well known that anyone who went to Mauthausen was dead within three months. They worked you to death. To accompany us on that trip, I'm reading you the final little bit of peace, uh, a, little bit, a little piece from the uh, Jewish Council, which was also overruled by the Germans. And it says, the Jewish Council again strongly advises you to keep ready at all times a backpack with all the necessities for your stay in the camps especially warm clothes and blankets. The lack of these items can lead to serious unpleasantness on your journey to Germany. Well, you can imagine my parents didn't want that serious unpleasantness and there was really no choice, so they bought backpacks. And I remember those backpacks sitting, sitting on shelves in our living room in the closet. And my father had very carefully painted our names on them, Nathan, Angeline, Eddie, Ati, and Freddie Lessing. And my mother had ironed, had washed and ironed clothes and put them in there so that we wouldn't be cold in that work relief in Germany. And so we were all set to go when the call would come from the Reichskommissar. And then suddenly, one morning, my grandfather Isaac showed up. My grandfather Isaac, who lived in the big city of Amsterdam, where most of Holland's Jews lived. And Isaac wanted to know what we were going to do, what my parents were going to do, about that work relief. And my parents showed him the backpacks we had, and they said, don't worry, we'll be fine. We got all the warm clothes and, you know, and the little blankets in there, and we'll be fine. It, it won't be easy to work hard in Germany, but it'll be okay. We'll, we'll. But my grandfather sounded an ominous note. He said, there are rumors going around in Amsterdam that you're not at all going to work in Germany. There are rumors going around, he said, in Amsterdam that the Germans are lying to us. He said, you must never go on those trains. You must try and hide. I will try and help you. And I sometimes have wondered about what that must have said to my parents. Every week out of Holland, a train with more than a thousand Dutch Jewish citizens, ranging from newborn babies to grandfathers and mothers, left Holland for that work relief in Germany. Every week, more than a thousand. Where were those trains going if there was no work relief, as my grandfather was telling us? Where were those trains going? And nobody knew, but there was a great fear in Holland among us Jews. And so my parents made a fateful decision. They decided we weren't going to go on those trains to the Reichskommissar of the occupied Dutch territories. We had to go into hiding. And on the 22nd of October, 1942, we took the stars, 
those yellow, filthy stars off our jackets and threw them in the wastebasket and walked out of our home. I remember my mother early in the morning pulling the door shut behind us of our home where we would never return. We spent that day at some friends in a suburb. And there that night, I lost my family. My parents walked out the door after dark to go into hiding someplace. My little brothers were picked up by friends to be hidden someplace else. And I was alone, left for a few more days to think of what would happen next. I was 16 years old. I had lost my home, my father, my mother, my brothers, my world. Not only that, from that day on, I would be a fugitive of the law, and anyone could report me to the German or the uh, collaborating Dutch police, and they would get a reward for having found a Jew who was trying to hide, and they would get a reward of $7. So, of course, the question came up, where could I hide? Now that all was lost. And it's time to introduce you to my mom. Um, here she is. I don't know if you can see her. Maybe I'll pick this up. My mother became the hero of this story, really. She's the one who got a false identity card and a false name and started traveling through Holland on the trains to try to find the few people who would hide a Jew. Those who were caught hiding Jews were usually sent to other concentration camps and usually didn't survive there either. So it was extremely dangerous and there were very, very few people who would hide Jews. But my mother did find a hiding place for herself and for her husband and she found a hiding place for my two little brothers and she came back to me and said, Ed, I'm sorry, I cannot find anyone who's willing to take a 16-year-old Jewish boy like you. And my mother was very inventive. She always had a plan. And she said, um, let's do this. I'm going to try and find a little farm someplace. And you're going to go there and work there as a, as a stable boy. You're going to get a false name and a false identity card. And you'll never reveal who you really are because that will be the end of you. And you'll learn to say those Christian prayers. And we'll, buy, we'll dye your hair, we'll bleach your hair because you look too Jewish. See, in those days, most Dutch kids had blonde hair, blue eyes. I didn't. So I stood out. So we bleached my hair. And I was supposed to come out blonde, of course. I must tell you, I came out a very cute redhead instead. <laughs> but it did help. Um, the farmer put me to work. My mother found a little farm, very small, man, with four cows, and he put me to work doing things that I never had done before. Here I was, with wooden shoes that made my feet bleed, with hands that were blistering and, f and, and bleeding from digging ditches in Holland's soggy ground. And I had to learn how to pull a calf out of a cow when she couldn't give birth. And all those things for a 16-year-old Jewish boy from a middle-class city life. And the worst was, of course, the diet, which was mostly black bread liberally smeared with lard. I can't recommend it. <laughs> but I couldn't complain. Any complaints might make the farmer suspicious, maybe call the police, and that would be the end of me. And after a while, I couldn't do it anymore. And I decided I'll give myself up to the Germans. It was useless. And I met my mother secretly in a pasture somewhere. And I said, Mom, I can't do it. And she said, she said, Ed, don't commit suicide. Let me try and find someone, someone else to hold on a little bit longer. I said, I can't sleep at night from fear. And in the daytime, I, I'm so scared. Everyone who walks by, I think, is going to come and arrest me. I was constantly, of course, constantly in terror. Because any moment could be the end of my life. And so my mother did find someone to help. She found a Dutch policeman who, um, by all other signs, looked like a collaborating 
Dutch Nazi, a friend of the Germans, he ramrod straight, always never smiling with a black cap and a black, there's a picture of him here, black cap and a black uniform, black boots, Officer Oskam, O-S-K-A-M, was his family name. You would have been mistaken. He was the head of the local Dutch resistance. He personally was hiding 30 Jewish men, women, and children to save them from the gas chambers. And Oskam said, Ed, I have a place where I can put you, but it's an extremely dangerous place. There are other men there. But once you go in, you can't come out, and you will have no contact with your mom or with anyone else. Do you still want to go there? And I thought anything would be better than be so terribly isolated by myself and that dark secret hanging over me. And I said, yes, whatever it is, I'll go there. And so one night, Oscar took me outside of his village, and he brought me to a parcel of woods, and I thought, why is he bringing me here? This is absolutely solid undergrowth, solid Christmas trees, you can't can't go in there, but there was a secret path had been made. We walked it until finally we suddenly got confronted by a hut that had been camouflaged by nailing little pine trees to it. And in that hut, Oscar left me with seven Dutch Christian men who had decided they were going to resist the Germans. And this was their headquarters. And so there I was. I became somewhat of a part of the Dutch resistance group. And the men would go out after dark. They would break into police stations and town halls, and there they would steal German rubber stamps and, and uh, papers, and especially weapons and uniforms, of which we had a large cache in the ground next to our hut. And I asked them, could you take me along? Hey, it sounded like fun going out at night, you know, breaking into a police station. I said, Ed, this isn't a Boy Scout game. You're only 17 years old, you're too young to die, we can't take you. And so, of course, many of them died and were executed in the dunes of Holland. And they have been lying there for 60 years in the cemetery for the Dutch resistance fighters. Many young college students, intellectuals, farmers, all kinds of people. But life was pretty good in the hut met some interesting people. Uh, and everything went fine until December 1943. Now, I had been on the run since October, as I told you, October 1942. So I've been on the run a little bit over a year. And we intercepted a message for, for, meant for the Germans that said, the Gestapo, the secret German police, had become suspicious of our woods. People had been seen walking around there. And it was immediately decided, by the men in the hut, we must set out watch posts, especially at dawn, because if the SS came, they usually came at dawn. And so we had to pick numbers out of a hat. I got the, I got the watch from uh, December 29, from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. I was issued a 9 millimeter Mauser semi-automatic pistol, shown how to load it, how to aim it, how to fire it, how to take the safety off with the safety on. And you could have found me at 5 o'clock on the 29th of December, together with a buddy, behind the last row of trees of our woods, watching the, dirt, the uh, gravel road leading to our, uh, our woods and hoping in the dark that nothing would happen. And then we heard truck tires, truck tires crunching on the gravel. And pretty soon we saw the blue slits of wartime German military truck lights coming around the bend and there were five trucks and they crept up in front of us and then they stopped and the lights went out. And when I heard the first German commands and saw in the half dark soldiers beginning to descend from those trucks, it suddenly struck me they were here to kill us. They were going to kill me. And I screamed in my head, Ed, run, save yourself. You're going to get killed. They're going to, they're going to shoot you. And I guess as I think now, the heavy weight of that gun in my pocket still made me aware of the seven, six men who were sleeping behind us in their bunk beds, not aware that anything was happening. And so my buddy and I, we didn't run away. We ran the zigzagging path back, stormed into the hut, started taking the blankets off the men, 
screaming at them, wake up, wake up, it's a raid. DSS is here, save yourself, save yourself. And the men in their sleep, jumping out of the bunk beds, trying to find shoes, <coughs> clothes, anything to run. There was screaming, there was crying. But when my buddy and I saw that they were all out of their bed, we didn't wait any longer. We ran to the site and we crashed through the woods and we came to a dirt road. And there was another parcel of woods beyond that. And before we jumped across, I looked to the left and I looked to the right. And it seemed to me that I saw the Germans coming around the corners already. And we jumped across and we ran and we ran and we ran. And it seemed to me that none of the men behind us would make it out alive. And that should have been enough for the day. But you see, we had, we had promised to, uh, to regroup about five miles away in another part of the woods at night. And so we thought we should do that, my buddy and I. And there we stood with our weapons in a hand behind some trees around a little clearing in the woods. And I had a good idea what would happen. The man would have been captured tortured to reveal that we were standing there waiting for them, and soon the SS would show up and they would either try to arrest us or they would kill us. But I thought, I have this gun. I will try and kill a German at least. And then they will mow me down, no doubt. But it was better, I thought, to die right there fast than to be captured by them and tortured to death somewhere in the basement of the Gestapo in Amsterdam. And so I was prepared for the end, really. When we heard this strange, strange noise coming through the woods, it was a rattling of sheet metal and like thumping of, a, of, of, of wheels on a dirt path. And a little flashlight, circle of light came out of the woods, stopped in the clearing. Someone had come on a rattly bicycle. The light of the flashlight went out, the bike rider got off, and we couldn't see who it was. Standing behind the trees, we watched, and I thought, this is it. This is a trap. A German has come, we'll step out, and he'll either shoot us or he'll try to arrest us. So I got my finger on the trigger, and my buddy and I slowly began to approach that bike rider, ready to fire. And when we came to that bike rider, we found it was not a German. It wasn't even one of the men from the hut, one of our buddies. The person who had come off that bike was my mom. Somehow, and I've never found out how, there are many secrets in the Holocaust and in hiding. Somehow she found out about the raid on the hut that morning. Somehow she found even out where we were waiting for the others and immediately decided she must rescue us. And the first thing she said is, bury those guns. And she said, are you crazy? That's the only thing we have to defend us. And she said, you don't know it. They're still looking for you. We're surrounded here by hundreds of Waffen-SS and Wehrmacht army. She said, if they find us with weapons, they'll probably execute us on the spot. Bury those weapons. Maybe we have a <laughs> tiny chance. Who knows? And so we buried our precious Mausers and had no defenses left. And my buddy said that he might know a place where he could hide, but he needed a bicycle. So my mom gave him that bicycle that rattled apart because it was on wooden wheels. You see the Germans having stolen every piece of rubber out of Holland. And she gave him her little flashlight and he pedaled off in the darkness. And that left my mom and me standing there surrounded by Germans somewhere out there in the darkness. And my mother made up a plan. And she told me what to do. And we started walking on a path through the wood towards that circle that must be out there of guards. And, and as we came through the path, we saw at the end of it a German with a shouldered rifle pacing back and forth. And as we neared, I did what she told me to do. We put our arms around each other, hugged very tightly, put our heads together, 
and started giggling and laughing and talking and making kissing sounds as we approached the German step by step. And when we came close, we waved to him and said, hello. And he said, halt. He tried to figure out who we were. He had been told to watch out for those dangerous armed resistance fighters from the hut. And here was this couple coming out of the woods. We kept those frozen smiles on us facing him. And finally he made up his mind. And it was either life or death. And he said, nah, Gainsey, go. And we said, thank you, Shen, thank you very much, wonderful, thank you, thank you. And we giggled some more and laughed some more with ice cold fear. We walked out of that circle of death to live another day. As you can imagine, I wasn't in the best of shape. They haven't been close to death twice that day. And some friendly people gave me a room on the second floor overlooking their garden. And there I had two weeks to stop shaking. And after those two weeks, I had to leave. I got myself a free Christian Bible. I got myself a new pair of wooden shoes. I bleached my hair again. And I walked out of that house into the land where the Gestapo, the secret German police, was still trying to find all of us and catch us. And I found a farmer who took me on and I began masquerading again as a, as a gentile farmhand, talking very little and working very hard from sunup until sundown and hoping, hoping that I would make it to the war. And that nothing would happen to me after 10,000 hours of fear. And then my mother was caught. In May 1944, on a train, she ran into a Gestapo who recognized that she had a false identity card. He arrested her, sent her to Amsterdam for interrogation at Gestapo headquarters sent her to a Dutch concentration camp from where she sent this tiny little square picture that I blew up that's standing here. And from there she was sent to a German concentration camp. And if you've, any of you will ever read or have read the story of Anne Frank and her sister Margot, who were sent to a concentration camp called Bergen-Belsen and perished there from disease and starvation. That's where my mother was sent. But we didn't know that. All we knew was that she was, that she was gone and I heard about it. I don't know how, somebody got to tell me. And I immediately decided I must try and find my father and my two little brothers. They must be hiding somewhere in Holland. And I found them hiding deep, deep in the countryside at the end of a dirt road in a, in a, little, in a little summer cottage. And I said, Pop, I'm gonna join you because the winter is coming on and there wasn't anything more to eat in Holland. There was no food, there was no electricity, there was no fuel, there was nothing. And so I joined my father and my two little brothers and we tried to get through that winter, that last winter of the war, the winter of the Battle of the Bulge, that winter when the last of Holland's Jews were sent to their death, where 16,000 Dutchmen were starving in the streets and dropped dead. And we went to the snow and the ice, knocking on doors of farms. Sir, would you have a slice of bread? Would you have an egg? Would you have a half a glass of milk? Anything. We begged, we borrowed, we stole, we lied, and tried to get to that winter. And every night, when we ate our last frozen bit, bits of, tur of turnips, which was the last thing we had to eat, we said a little prayer to my mom who had wanted to save us all and it was gone and we didn't know where. But we did make it through the winter. Spring came 
with the blessed warmth of the spring sun in May, and with it the Canadian army that crossed the Rhine River, and uh, as the thanks for surviving bombarded us with the three, three days and nights of heavy artillery fire, <laughs> which we survived by digging a hole in the ground and hiding there. But after the third night, it suddenly stopped and it became eerily silent and we crawled out on shaking knees and we looked where the Germans were. And we didn't see any Germans. And we looked, the Dutch farmers weren't even there who lived around there. And the only thing we heard was this strange roaring noise coming out of the fields of Holland where there was no highway, there was no road. What could that be? And we went to see what could cause that noise. And I think I saw the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. An endless column of green army vehicles with white stars on them approaching us through Holland's fields. And we rushed to greet them, and we stood as the tanks went by and threw the dust all over us. And after the tanks came personnel carriers with smiling soldiers, and after that came, an, came ambulances, and after that came kitchens with guys cooking as they went along, and finally came a whole parade of these tiny little cars full of grinning soldiers covered with dust from the battles. For some reason they called these cars with a funny name, Jeeps. <laughs> and we shouted, thank you, thank you, thank you, a thousand times, thank you. Because they couldn't have known that they didn't just liberate us. They saved our lives. And we will never forget it. My brothers and I will never forget to the end of our lives that it was those allied men and women who also fought and died for us and saved our lives. And that's another reason why I'm so deeply grateful to be able to be invited here and speak to you people. And so we were free. It was over five years of German terror, two and a half years of denying who we were, denying that we were Jews, that we, were, that we had names. We were looked upon as vermin, but it was over. For us, we were free. But then we started to hear things that we couldn't believe at first. Names like Sobibor, Belzec, Auschwitz, Birkenau. What were these places? We had never heard these names before. And then we heard what happened there. That not hundreds, not thousands, but <coughs> millions of people had been murdered there annihilated. And then we began to find out where those trains to that work relief in Germany had gone with our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters. Our grandparents had not gone to any work relief. They had gone to the death camps. They had been beaten to death, starved to death, worked to death, gassed to death. They were all gone. Six million of Europe's Jews destroyed innocent people. Among them, one and a half million Jewish and Gypsy children brutally murdered. Why? What had they done? We hitchhiked back to Delft on a British army truck and we were given a new apartments that had belonged to Dutch Nazis. And we, my father was given a piano and we got some stuff and forks and knives to eat with and we moved in. And my little <coughs> brothers went back to school and even I went back to school. We tried to start life again. Hans came one day to me. My cousin Hans, still alive. He's still alive, he lives in Springfield, Massachusetts. I always tell him, hey Hans, I'm always telling about you to these people. Oh, he said, really? Well, <laughs> what did we do? Uh, Hans came and said, hey, Han hey, hey Ed. He said, uh, um, you know, there's a group of, of young people, our kids who, who were in hiding, who have, who have survived, 
and they're, they're, they're in the city in The Hague and, and they're, they're, they're dancing and they're singing there and they, they're, they're singing songs about uh, uh, Palestine. They want to go there. And he said, there are very nice girls there. I said, oh, I'll, I'm going to go. <laughs> Listen, I, had been, I was 19 years old. I had never been kissed by a girl. <laughs> and so I went. I met my wife there. Nice girl. Also had come out of hiding. She had been hidden in Delft, by the way, where I had run away from. And uh, it was wonderful. Soldiers showed up. Jewish soldiers with the Star of David on their arm. The Jewish Brigade. They had fought in Italy. They were volunteers, Jewish volunteers from Palestine. And they wanted us so badly. They brought us out of the filth that we had stepped upon and came out, came out and they lifted us up and they helped us and celebrated us. Because for, for them, we were gold. I came back one night from one of these uh, Zionist, this is Zionist organization meetings, and there was a British army truck standing in front of our uh, new home there, and, and uh, it uh, had a camouflage canvas over it, and as I walked, it was dark already, I remember, the street lights were on, and as I walked by, by the back of this truck, a voice came out from under that truck, under that canvas, a woman's voice that said, oh sir, would you know where the Lessings live? And I could barely answer her. That was the voice of my mother. I'm sorry. I know in your introduction, you mentioned my mother had died, but thank God she survived. Um, my mother come back as from the dead. It's a wonderful story how she survived. And I don't think I have time to tell it, but it, here she was, back. And so we were all together. One of the few families in Holland that survived intact because Holland has the worst rate of survival of Jews. 80% of Holland's Jewish community was destroyed. And so we were together and pretty soon we emigrated to this country. And we began new lives. And uh, my girlfriend from Holland came over and we got married in that great capital of Chicopee, Massachusetts. <laughs> and uh, then we sailed on a ship to the newborn land of Israel. In 1950, it was two years old then, because we were idealists. And we sailed to this farm, this communal farm, where you didn't earn any money, and you just worked very hard, and you got everything you need, supposedly, anyway. And uh, we worked for five years. I worked on a tractor, plowing the land, and my wife helped grow the first new Israeli babies. And so we came back after five years in 1956 to this country. And uh, 50 years after the end of the war, I began to tell this story about our survival. Quite often I'm being asked, Mr. Lessing, isn't there something good you could tell us about the Holocaust? Is it all this terrible, terrible mass murder? And I always mention Oscom. Oscom, a rescuer. I said, there are always rescuers. There are always rescuers. What about, and you know I include, what, what about those 300, firefighters and policemen and others who rushed into those buildings in 2000, September 11, 2001 in New York to try and save those who were burning up above them. They were rescuers and they paid, with it, paid for it with their lives being buried when those buildings collapsed on top of them. They're always rescuers and we should honor them. There's a museum in Jerusalem, it's called Yad Vashem. There you can walk outside on the line of Nice trees, and under each tree there's a little metal sign with the name of a person who has saved a Jewish life at the peril of their own, very often. And these people have been given a beautiful name. 
They are called the righteous among the nations. And I always think that those are the people we must emulate. We must always think of them. We must always keep on fighting for the dignity of man. To be rescuers, to be helpers, and not haters. So who knows, we might prevent someday another Holocaust someplace. And certainly another attack on America. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. If anyone has questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I realize I didn't explain some of these boards that are standing here. Um, I'm, I welcome questions, and, uh, but my hearing is awful, so some people will, if you have a question, um, they'll go around and let, let you speak in a, in a microphone. Sir, what did happen to your mother? Oh, <laughs> you had to ask this. <laughs> no, I love to tell it. Um, however, it, it, it's a little bit, the, how much time do we have? Anyone tell us? Plenty of time. Plenty of time? Great. So my mother gets arrested by the Gestapo on the train and he puts her in a separate compartment in a train to Amsterdam and you know in Europe they have these compartments with a corridor next to it and she puts a, a Dutch policeman guarding her. And my mother realizes that in her handbag she has all our addresses. And so she sits in that compartment and on her way to Amsterdam takes every scrap of paper out of her bag, tears it into little pieces and chews it up and swallows it. So that when she gets to Amsterdam in front of the Gestapo, she was some lady, wasn't she? Uh, she comes in front of the Gestapo. They say all they have is her false identity card now. And they said, so who are you? You're obviously a Jew. Who are you? And she gives her maiden name, which is a very good Dutch name. She says, my name is Angeline Elizabeth Van Leer, L-E-E-R, which was really her maiden name. And uh, out of the blue, she screams at them and said, you have no right to keep me here. I'm an American citizen. <laughs> they must have laughed, these Germans. Every Jew, they called that, of course, another excuse not to be killed in the gas chambers. Ha, ah, they said, so you're an American citizen, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Mrs. Van Leer, uh, do you have a husband? Yes, she says, I have a husband. And where is he? Uh, he's in the American Merchant Marine. Aha, uh -huh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, hmm. Do you have any children? No, I don't have any children. Well, Mrs. Lessing, Mrs. Van Leer, not Lessing, Mrs. Van Leer, um, since you claim to be an American citizen, uh, you probably have no problem giving us an address in the United States where you live or have lived. No, she says, no problem. She says, 129 Lamartine Street, Jamaica Plain, Boston. Whoa. <laughs> so she heard a German officer behind her say, so there's at least one Jew who knows where she lives. <laughs> you might well ask where the hell did she get that address, right? Well, back to 1929. When I was three years old and when my parents decided they wanted to emigrate to the United States from Holland. And so we moved to the United States, 1929. Was there a worse, t worse time to come to the States? <sighs> and everything went wrong. My father got sick, he got tuberculosis. My mother had to go out and work. She farmed me out to a woman who abused me. Everything went wrong. So after three years, we moved back to Holland. 
but we did live in 1929 at 129 Lamartine Street, Jamaica Plain, Boston. And my mother remembered it when she was in front of the Gestapo. And they wrote it down, but they sent her to Bergen-Belsen. And she's in Bergen-Belsen, and she manages to get a night job in the kitchen to steal once in a while a half a potato to keep her alive. And she comes home, comes home, she comes to her barracks one morning to her friend, another Dutch Jewish lady who she is bunking with, both three, three bunks, beds above each other. And her friend says, lean. There's a uh, SS man in the next barracks. He's taking names of people with foreign nationality and papers. So, my mother, what? She said, you told them you're an American citizen. <laughs> she said, you know, I'm not an American citizen. It's just, I just made it up. She said, but her friend kept up and said, go, go. What do you have to lose? And so my mother, weary as she was and underfed, dragged herself through the mud and the snow of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp to that barracks. And there was an SS man sitting in his black uniform with a little table and a list in front of him. And he said, what do you want? She said, I hear you're taking names and checking on names for foreign nationality. He said, yes, what? What's your name? She says, Angeline Elizabeth Van Leer. Yes, she said, you're on the list. He said, get yourself ready in three days from now. You will be leaving on a train from here. You will be exchanged for a German citizen. And she didn't believe a word of it because they had done it before. Put a thousand people on a train, tell them that they were going to go to freedom, going to be exchanged, and they'd send them straight to the gas chambers. A couple of days later, they were ashes. So she didn't believe a word. But a couple of days later, there was a train standing out there. Bergen-Belsen didn't have a spur into the camp. You had to walk two miles to the railroad station. And so my mother was told to pick up her belongings, which was this much, and to walk with 300 other prisoners of Bergen-Belsen that had been selected to walk to that train, which was a passenger train with a big red cross on it. And as she came in there, she, there was an SS man sitting there, and she said, could I have a little water? I'm so thirsty. I said, sit down. You're going to get coffee soon. And of course, nobody had seen coffee for years. So she didn't believe that either. But when a nurse in a white starch uniform came through the train with real coffee, she began to believe that something magical might happen. And that train took off and meandered through Germany. And all the shades were down. And they were told by the SS upon the punishment of death to not raise the shades. Yeah, my mother, she was peaked anyway. <laughs> and she saw with great pleasure that every city they went through, every German city was a complete ruins bombed out by English and American bombers. And they wound up after a couple of days at the Swiss border, a little town called St. Gallen, and there, as their train came in on one platform, another one came in on the other side, full of Germans. And those Germans were so happy. They were all singing the Horst Wessel Lied, the Nazi anthem. And on the other side, my parents said, we sang Yankee Doodle. We didn't know what else to sing. <laughs> and they were liberated. They were exchanged. Ironically, those Germans came from Palestine. I was in uh, Israel last October in Tel Aviv and uh, <laughs> I was astounded. They took me up to a 45, 45th floor of, a, of an office building, glass office building. It seemed like Manhattan. And I looked down and I said, what are those yellow houses there, those funny little houses that are among these skyscrapers there? Oh, they said, those are, are, were from the uh, 
from the Germans uh, who were, uh, you know, living here, um, and they were exchanged for some prisoners, uh, I understand. They were sent to Germany. And I thought, my God, I'm meeting up. I'm seeing the houses for those people who traveled to Germany, who were so happy to be with the Fuhrer. But my mother was given a choice. She could either, either she was told she could go to Palestine, or she could go to her sister in Massachusetts, or she could go to a United Nations rehabilitation camp. And she thought a United Nations rehabilitation camp might be better because she might be closer to Europe in case that her husband and her three sons would survive, which she didn't think they would. She might be closer to them. And so they put her on a ship that went over the Mediterranean and they brought her to a little town called Philipville, which is in Algiers, which is in North Africa. And that is where my mother wound up <coughs> and where she ended the war and where she got uh, very soon became the office manager of the American mess hall there. <laughs> and so my mother was saved, saved herself, and was in North Africa. And as a funny ending of this story, my father, after our liberation, heard that there, there, was, there were some old men who had a list of survivors the Red Cross, and uh, in a nearby town from where we had been hiding. I'm going back now to uh, two weeks after our liberation, uh, May 1945. And uh, my father said, you know, I'm going to go there, he said to us, my two brothers and I, I'm going to go there, find out if they know anything about your mom. The idea that anybody was killed didn't exist yet in his mind, in our mind. All we knew was that she had been arrested and she should be somewhere out there. So he went on his rattly bicycle, and a second rattly bicycle, and he uh, wound up in Barneveld, a little town, and there on the second floor, he, there were three old men with some lists. And he asked, uh, and they said, yes, sir, can we help you, sir? And he said, yeah, my name is, uh, my name is Nathan Lessing, and uh, my wife was arrested, I would like to know where she is. And uh, they said, well, Mr. Lessing, right now, um, uh, we haven't got much information, but when you come back next week, you'll be very happy. We'll have a list of everybody where they are. Oh, so my father, okay. And a week later, he got on his mic again and he went there. And there were those three old men. And as he tells it to, to us later on, he said, I didn't recognize them hardly. They seemed so beaten down. And he asked, what is the matter? And they said, Mr. Lessing, we have just found out what had happened in Germany and in Poland. The lists are very short. Almost no one survived. Most of them were killed. My father said, uh, could you see if my wife is maybe on the list? And so one of the old gentlemen got a list and he said, uh, let me see, uh, I can't give you much hope. And he said, but she's here. Angeline, Elizabeth, Lessing, Van Leer. Is that your wife? Yeah, my father. So uh, where can I pick her up? <laughs> Why should we were kind of naive, I guess. They said, Mr. Lessing, um, it says here your wife is in Philipville. Oh, so my father, uh, where the hell is Philipville? Uh, they said that's in, um, that's in Algeria, in North Africa. And my father said, uh, oh, no, that's impossible. Because we never had anything to do with Africa. We never were in Africa. What are you talking about, Africa? My wife isn't in Africa. Why would she be in Africa? And the old man got very huffy. He said, Mr. Lessing, the Red Cross never makes a mistake. Please go home, tell your children their mother has survived. And he said, yes, I guess I'll do that. That's the answer to your question. Sir, phenomenal, phenomenal story. I'm glad um, you enjoyed it. Story is not right. Um, 
phenomenal piece of your history, of your life, that, uh, you know, I, I'm, you never know what you do when you go out, uh, when you're in the Army and you're in the service and, and you go to another country and you're trying to defend your own country, and you don't know what the impact is that you have on people. And, and for, for us soldiers, to, to think about what you just said was, you reminded us again about, uh, although as we protect our own country, there's others around this world here that cherish freedom and they are living the downside of people who don't respect others and who don't have the opportunity for pursuit of happiness. And then when the United States, when the soldiers and sailors and Marines come, come forward to protect their own country, the other consequences of that is that people are freed. Their spirits are lifted. And uh, to hear you say that to us uh, and to think about what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan now and the fact that, that little girls are going to school in Afghanistan, they, I believe, in 10, 15 years will be telling the story of how fortunate they were because somebody came and cared enough about themselves. And it's, uh, it's uplifting to us. Um, and again, now that's just from our own per personal perspective. Sir, your life is, is an incredible, uh, has been an incredible life. And uh, it, it's been interesting. I'm sure, <laughs> interesting is a word. Uh, it, but it is. And, and for you to take the time to come tell us and share the story with us is helpful because all of us will go out and tell our, the people that we work with about who Mr. Ed Lessing is. And this thing, uh, pay it forward, is something I believe in. It's powerful. And you're paying it forward. And uh, I don't know what the, uh, the consequences are down the road, but I know that uh, something good happened today, and it will continue to be good because we will pass it on. And thank you for sharing your wonderful life with us. I thank you very much. Sir, please. Beautiful words. I know you have uh, many things on your wall and other places. Please, we hope that you'll Not like this. Uh, not like this. <laughs> It's, uh, please take this, it's uh, just our, our clumsy way of saying uh, thank you and uh, we, uh, we really respect you for what you represent and, uh, and admire you for what you went through. Sir. Thank you again, General. Sir, we're going to walk downstairs here. While the general is uh, coming off the stage, he made reference to the Avenue of the Righteous at Yad Vashem in Israel. Men and women like Oscar Schindler have trees there planted with their names on them. Somebody had to make a huge sign out of mosaics to denominate and point out that trail to honor the, the righteous Gentiles. It's done in Hebrew, done in French, and done in English. My mother created that sign. <laughs> it is a story that twists around and eventually envelops us all. Sergeant uh, First Class Samuel Case, an Equal Opportunity Advisor for the 59th Ordnance Brigade, is going now to announce the winners of Team Redstone's SA and Static Display Contest. And with him, uh, General Miles will uh, present the awards to the contest winners. <coughs> In support of this year's Days of Remembrance Observance 2008, Team Redstone always sponsors an essay writing and static display contest. The purpose of the contest is to enhance educational awareness through remembering some of the atrocities and the racial hatred that many have endured in our world due to extremism. We would like to thank all that participated in the contest the awards for the static display contest will be presented first, followed by the awards for the essay writing. Without further delay, and to assist me, Major General Miles will present awards for the static display contest. The winners will receive a trophy, CG certificates, and coins. Third place winner is Space and Missile Defense Command. Second place winner is the NCO Academy. Ooh. First place winner for the Days of Remembrance Static Display Contest goes to PEO Missile in Space.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, Miles will present the awards for the winners of the essay writing contest. The winners will receive an acrylic, CG certificates and coins, as well as MWR gift certificates. Third place winner is Mr. Dorman Chastain from J Lens under SMDC, who is not here today, but uh, I will accept it on his behalf. Okay. Second place winner is First Sergeant Jacob Andrus of HHC 59th Orders Brigade. <laughs> and the first place winner for the Days of Remembrance essay writing contest is Ms. Kim Torres from the Civilian Personnel Advisory Center. <laughs> Today's uh, closing remarks for the program will be conducted by Sergeant First Class Monique Mixon, the Equal Opportunity Advisor for the U.S. Army Aviation and Missile Life Cycle Management Command, and U.S. Army Garrison Redstone. Sergeant. Good morning. Thank you for attending Team Redstone's Days of Remembrance Commemoration Program. It takes the combined efforts of many people and resources to organize, coordinate, and execute these types of programs. I would like to thank the planning committee for their relentless efforts in planning the program, our keynote speaker, Mr. Lesson, for sharing his story of survival with us, and the program participants for volunteering their individual talents, all of which greatly contributed to the execution of today's program. Also, I'd like to thank PEO Missile and Space, the NCO Academy, and the Space and Missile Defense Command, and the Post Library for enhancing the awareness of today's program. Please take a moment to visit this, the displays in the day room, which is located to the right as you exit the room. Please join us next month for Team Redstone's Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month program. The program is scheduled for 27th of May, 1300 hours at the Bob Jones Auditorium. At this time, please turn, turn to the back of your programs. If you have a blue dot in your program, you are a winner of a decorative box of cookies. If you have, <laughs> if you have a yellow dot on your program, you are a winner of a Kellogg's Tony the Tiger soccer ball. And if you have a red dot on the back of your program, you are a winner of an AP skip certificate. At the end of the program, all winners must report to the front of the stage with their programs to receive their door prize. The door prize is our way of saying we really appreciate you attending today's program. Again, thanks for everyone who attended and have a wonderful day.